Good morning, Robin. Good morning, James. Great. This is working. Um, thanks very much for talking to me. Um, I'd like to talk to about Schroeder H Total Return. It's actually a fund that I haven't done an awful lot of work on in the past. So, so you're going to be educating me as well as the readers as we go. So um, without further ado, do you want to just say a little bit about the fund and what you're trying to achieve, please? Yeah. Um, then obviously, well, I'll try and do this in about 10 minutes, James, and then uh, leave you all to ask questions. I think there's some charts. Yeah, if you've got the first chart there, um, the first page, just maybe a little backdrop to the fund and myself. Um, I've been uh, at Schroeder's now for it's 31 years next week. Um, nearly all my career has been spent uh, in Asia. So I spent 25 years in Hong Kong and Singapore, um, where laterally I was um, head of the team uh, in Hong Kong for about 10 years. Um, to the fund, I run with my colleague, King Fui, who's based in Singapore, and King Fui and I have worked together for over 20 years. And really the Asian total return strategy, there's an open end vehicle as well as the investment trust, is really a distillation of what King Fui and I, with our 50 odd years experience, uh, genuinely think is the best way to invest in Asia. I do have, uh, we disclose it in the annual report, King Fui and I do have quite a lot of our, our own money in the fund. So we definitely uh, do put our money where our mouth is. And I always say my, my key client is my wife, who used to work at JP Morgan and is Scottish as well. So she's a challenging, a challenging client on all, 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 all counts. But really the background to the fund, and this is what I, the, the, I really want the audience to take away, is I think a lot of time, maybe a little bit less so these days, but certainly if you go back historically, I think the way emerging market fund managers and Asian fund managers have tried to sell the asset class has been really on a fairly spurious premise. And that premise really is that GDP growth somehow miraculously equals stock market returns. So, you know, buy countries with faster growing economies, you'll make more money than if you put your money in a slow growing economy. I think given what's happened over the last 10 years, we all know that is completely bogus. Obviously the US has been by far the best performing major stock market in the world and not necessarily the fastest growing economy. China continues to be a strongly growing economy and broadly speaking, a disappointing stock market, particularly as I'm sure the audience is well aware over the last six months. But you know, if you're taking a very long-term series, it also applies, this chart goes back a hundred years, best performing stock market in the 20th century was Australia and Australia was not the fastest growing economy uh, as it shows. So first thing to take away is do not think you should strategically put massive amounts of money in emerging markets in Asia, because that means you're going to make higher returns because the economies grow faster. That does not work. So that's part of what we're getting to with the fund. If you skip on to the next page, James, just for the audience, hopefully it'll come up. Ooh, seems to have got stuck. There we go. Um, why is this, why don't the stock markets correlate? And it's pretty blindingly obvious why stock markets in Asia don't correlate with uh, GDP growth because they don't represent the domestic economy, stock markets um, in Asia, lots and lots of cyclicals, good cyclicals like TSMC and Samsung and you know BHP and Rio are listed in Australia. Um, lots of banks and real estate, we all know the issues with banks, um, real estate is a sector bedeviled with issues, but domestic demand is actually quite a small part of the index. So there's absolutely no reason to think that, that chart on the left-hand side, that stock market with that kind of makeup is going to correlate with domestic GDP growth. Um, and as you can see from the right-hand side, what has the Asian index correlated with? It's much closer correlation with the MSCI world. Capital markets are global and Asia, broadly speaking, are part of global capital markets. You know, and often the best companies in Asia are actually those companies you might classify as cyclicals. It's global leaders in the technology space. There is good domestic demand companies. But a lot of um, banks and real estate are state-owned enterprises, uh, lots of corruption and governance issues. So, you know, this is an asset class that you, know, you do need to be very selective. It's a stock pickers, I would say, I was considered, I, I, was, I joined Schroeder's as a graduate trainee and I got sent to Asia rather than, you know, at that time, when I joined in 1990, the prime job at Schroeder's was to be a UK 
equity analyst. Um, Asia was a bit of a backwater, but I thank God I did get sent to a backwater because the one thing in Asia and emerging markets is it's a stock picker's dream. It's a stock picker's market. So you buy Asia really for alpha, don't necessarily just rush and buy it for the beta and think we're going to make loads and loads of money. Most good Asian active fund managers do outperform their index. If you look at the, obviously the Asian investment trust universe, all the investment trusts, certainly on the winter flood sheets, are outperforming the benchmark over five years, most of, them, most of them by some some substantial margin. So, like I said, this is a, a great market for stock pickers, but not necessarily one you just think you're going to chase beta. Um, if you move on to the next page, James. What do we actually do for the Asian Total Return Investment Company? So, obviously, probably not surprising given what I've just said. We don't care about the index. We ignore it. We're trying to buy you good companies that are going to make us money. So we're only focused on absolute returns, um, which sounds a bit blindingly obvious, but often you see people investing on relative returns. They have stakes in a company, even though you think it's uh, overvalued because it's a big part of the index. That's not the way we think. We only have 50 or so stocks in the fund that we think are going to make us money. We're not looking at relative returns because we're not interested in the index because we don't think the index in Asia, as hopefully we've highlighted, represents the opportunity, which is to make money. Um, for top down for us, obviously, Asian stock markets are a volatile asset class. Um, what we do, and this is what probably makes the fund the key differentiating factor from some of our peers, for us, top down is about understanding risks. We use quant models to help us understand those risks based on historic trading patterns in Asia. Are markets over vulnerable, uh, overvalued? Are they vulnerable to correction? Because Asia does have big swings up and down. It's, sometimes it's flavor of the month, lots of money flowing in, and then it comes out because there's a, a scandal or, you know, obviously we, we can go on to talk about China, but there's obviously lots of uh, de negative developments happening there at the moment, certainly negative from a stock market return perspective. Um, so us, for us, we use models and where we see vulnerabilities in the market, we take money off the table, typically by selling index futures or buying puts on indices. So that gives, hopefully gives the fund an element of capital preservation so that you get better risk adjusted returns. So what we're aiming to do in a volatile asset class like Asian equities is reduce the volatility, give holders some downside protection and get a better overall result. So the way King Fu and I are appraised is on our risk adjusted returns. So have we made money and have we made it in a much less volatile way? Which broadly speaking, I don't want to get too technical on the call, but the volatility of the fund, defined by the standard deviation of returns, has been running, the fund's been going, the strategy on the open-end vehicle since 2007, the investment trust for about eight years, we're running at about two thirds or 60% of the index level in terms of volatility. So, um, you know, it, it has, the hedging strategies have reduced the volatility. So if you go on to page four, thanks James. How are we positioned currently? Um, so the fund's fully invested, uh, very slightly geared, um, but 5% geared. We're holding around 60 stocks. For those that are interested, the difference between the investment trust and the open-ended vehicle is the investment trust's about seven, or I, I'm talking US dollars because I'm a US dollar-based person, about 750 million US dollars. The open-ended fund, seven billion US dollars, so substantially bigger. What does that mean for the investment trust? We can buy mid and small caps that are too illiquid for the open-ended vehicles. So the big difference is we have, we can use gearing on the investment trust and we have around about at the moment, eight mid cap, small cap stocks are, are you know, our key small cap picks that are too small for uh, the open-ended vehicle, which is 10 times the size. Um, performance wise, the investment trust, broadly speaking, has been averaging one to 2% better than the open-ended vehicle through the small caps and the use of use of gearing. The hedging overlays, so we did mention we use hedging overlays, and this will give you a flavor for how we're looking at markets at the moment. Um, we run King Free, my colleague that I run the fund with, his background is maths and econometrics, so he runs the models, not me. Uh, I'm, I spend more time stock picking, uh, but the two sets of models that we run the, the quant models, as we call them for the fund, are mildly cautious at the moment. So they're actually turning this as a wee bit out of date. We just run the models 
We run them at the beginning of each month. So in early September with the correction in China that we've seen over the last two months, the models have turned a little bit more po positive. But broadly speaking, uh, we're still neutral to, to slightly cautious uh, on markets. There's two sets of models. One look out long term, the country models, which are based around mean reversion. Again, those wanting to be a bit more technical, it's based around Campbell and Schiller's work. It's a dynamic version of mean reversion. Um, so that looks out one to two years. Step three is a shorter term model that looks out three to six months based on historic trading patterns, sentiment, technicals, inflationary expectation, economic numbers, valuations, how do markets normally trade uh, on a three to six month view based on past historic trading patterns. Um, that model, the tactical ones, neutral, the country models are cautious because of valuations. So what does that mean in, 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 in how do we end up positioned on the fund? As I mentioned, we are fully invested. We've got plenty of stock ideas, but we do have some hedges in place because the models are saying there are downside risks that you should be looking to hedge against. So we've got some puts on the S&P index reflecting global risks, and then the Hang Seng Chinese Enterprise Index and the Taiwanese Index reflecting more Asian risks, which has obviously been, the, the, the puts on the Chinese indexes have been quite positive for performance, uh, obviously over the last, last two months. James, if we move on to the next page, we're gonna just drill down a little bit more detail on positioning. So in terms of, sorry, that's a busy chart for, for everyone, but if you focus on the grand total line at the bottom, towards the bottom uh, of the page, grand total for a country weights. Um, and just what I want to highlight really to clients, our fund is not particularly China centric for those of you worried about China, or those of you that want a lot of China, this is not the right fund. We only have around about, as at today, 12% of the fund in China because we've actually reduced weighting slightly further. Um, and the fund's quite balanced across the main Asian stock markets. So there's about, if we include the resource stocks we have in Australia, which we actually on the UK listed version, so about 15, 16% in Australia, almost 20% in Taiwan, which is mostly quite heavily technology focused. And then about 10, 11% in Hong Kong, Singapore, India, and Korea. So it's balanced across uh, the main uh, liquid big Asian stock markets. We don't have a lot in the smaller ASEAN markets because we're really struggling with both the long-term structural economic outlook in places like Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, but also struggling with the valuations. So that's really where on a country basis, the key message here is this is quite a balanced fund. It's not particularly China centric. In terms of stock positions, which I think is perhaps more, or sector positions, more what King Fu and I look at, we have about 35% in technology. Um, so that's mostly in semiconductors and software. Um, so there's um, we have big positions in TSMC, Samsung, but also companies like MediaTek. So these are companies that are global leaders in their technology space. It's not people assembling TVs or computers. It's semiconductor companies, both fabricators of semiconductors and chip designers. So ARM, for those of you in the UK background, is a chip designer. There's lots of good quality chip designers in Asia that design the integrated circuits that go into our smartphones and our our computers and our you know uh, our, our, all our telecom equipment um, and that's how we have quite a lot of software companies both a little bit in in China but also in, in India too and the other big position if you look at the top on the right hand side uh, consumer stocks we have about thirty percent in consumer stocks so basically the fund is you know predominantly weighted in global leading companies based in Asia uh, so that. that with a weighting towards technology, uh, and then consumer stocks that you know our favoured plays that you know the growth in middle classes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, happens in a, that we see uh, is about thirty percent of the fund. So, James, if you could skip on to the next page, please. Um, the top ten in the fund names, I guess, I guess the audience should be familiar with some of these names: TSMC, Samsung, Tencent, um, Tektronics is Power Tools, fourth biggest position in the fund, been a very successful company. It's now the world's largest manufacturer of electric power tools. It's now bigger than 
Black & Decker in electric power tools. Black & Decker is a bigger company, um, owns a brand called Milwaukee and Ryobi. You will see them in the stores here, but they're big markets, the States, uh, and they've really beaten Black & Decker at their own game by being utterly focused on improving their battery technology, improving their motors, and the way you integrate the motors and batteries to work together. Uh, so obviously the big improvements in battery technology has really expanded the addressable market for power tools, which I'm sure many of us have seen. If you go down to uh, B&Q in the UK, you'll see there's a lot more uh, battery powered tools. Anything that used to be corded or petrol can now be battery, whether that's pneumatic power drivers, chainsaws, lawnmowers, hedge cutters, strimmers, all of these can now be battery and you can interchange the batteries on those equipment so you can keep the run times up. Um, so as I said, the rest of the stocks, you know, we can talk about, but MediaTek, Boltronics, obviously tech companies, uh, based in Asia, AIA's insurance emphasis and is software. Um, that's really, you know, what I was going to say uh, on the fund, James. I'm very happy to answer questions. I'm sure there's going to be some on China, or I would expect there's going to be some on China. So there is some charts on China, but why don't I put it back to you, James, and uh, open it up to questions, please? Oh, well, the first question I've got is, how does increased regulation in China impact on the rider Asian region? So I think we go straight into that. Great. I thought, I thought that might come up. It is the, the, the million dollar question or the trillion dollar question, obviously, as we know, given the amount of money that's been lost in China stocks over the last couple of months. Why don't we go to page seven and we'll just maybe have a little highlight what, what the China policy is about. And first thing, in terms of the broader region, sorry, if it was, um, that, that's, that's fine, James, thank you. In terms of the broader region, I don't think there's too much read across for the broader region at the moment um, from the, 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 the Chinese measures. What, 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 what President Xi and the Communist Party are trying to achieve is really very specific to China. So this is a, a domestic issue that has quite big bearings on both the stock market, obviously immediately, and potentially the economy uh, medium term. So there may be secondary impacts, but what's President Xi trying to do? What's this all about? So. You know, what does common prosperity mean? So as it says in the chart, that's the buzzword they use. Common prosperity, if you wanted to put it in a, in a, a UK context, it can, you could almost replace it with levelling up. It's trying to increase in equality in China. The Gini coefficient or measures of inequality in China have really gone up quite substantially over the last 10 years. China's Gini coefficient's higher than the US now, so it's really quite an unequal economy. That's the chart on the right hand side. The top quintile has got a lot wealthier. The bottom quintile hasn't got any wealthier. And the middle class has got a little bit wealthier. That's the yellow line in the chart. But when you put into the fact that they're getting squeezed on their property prices, insurance costs, utility costs, all the stuff, you know, from a UK audience, we all feel as well. Um, you know, that there is a groundswell of opinion that, that the wealth is not being shared equally. President Xi is also worrying, which on the left-hand side, um, I'm sure as most of the audience is aware, China relaxed its one-child policy two years ago and now has effectively scrapped it, but the birth rate has kept falling and there's rumours that the actual demographics in China are worse than the official numbers because the, the state governments have made have been generous with their numbers to try and keep the central government happy, that the demographics are actually substantially you know, problematic. We know they're problematic because uh, there is very few young people in China. So you've got a demographic time bomb. So they need to try and encourage people to have more children. China's running way below its replacement rate. One of the reasons, and if you talk to, obviously showed us it's a big business in Asia. I used to obviously run it. Uh, we've got a big office in Shanghai, but if you talk to my colleagues in Shanghai, all of them, if they do have children, they only have one child and they all complain they only have one child because it's too expensive to have more because as it says there, the three mountains, property, education, and healthcare costs. So that's the real focus for common prosperity. It's about leveling up, but there is other agendas here, which is why the internet stocks have really got taken, to, you, know, got, you know, become part of this. It's about data and who controls the data. So as we know, um, President Xi and the Communist Party like to control things in China. So they want to control the data. It's about financial risks, worrying that things like Ant Group, um, Luxshare, Tenpay, unregulated fintech companies were creating financial risks. We've obviously got several property companies in China looking like they're going to go 
going to default and probably go bankrupt like Evergrande. So it is about controlling financial risks. And it's also about what President Xi calls dual circulation. And dual circulation basically means self-sufficiency. So it's China, because of trade tensions in the US, making sure they have the skill sets to fabricate their own semiconductors, be a global leader in EVs, AI, biotech, uh, green energy, decarbonization, all the, the buzzwords we talk about. So it's basically a big policy reset, but you know, rather than in the West, we would do this policy reset by nudges and possibly using market forces. At the end of it all, China is a communist country. It's done by much more you know, draconian measures and measures from the top down to push everyone into place, which uh, if you go on to page eight, please, James, we all go on to explain what it means for a stock market in China. You know, what does it mean for the stock market in China? Effectively, because the internet stocks, which is really what we're talking about here, education stocks have disappeared. They've been turned into non-profits. It's not that bad for the internet stocks. So these are your, your Meituans, Alibaba's, Tencent, all the, the big bellwether global companies we've all he heard of, JD, Pindudu, these are massive, you know, just even now still four or five hundred billion dollar companies uh, for, 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 for most of them. Um, big chunk of the index in China, that's the chart on the left hand side, they were 40% of the index. Um, what, if you go back historically, when I, you know, obviously I've been around a long time, telecom stocks used to be in China 60% of the index, banks were once 40% of the index. Um, once the market realized that telecom stocks and bank stocks in China were effectively state-owned enterprises, so were basically beholden to the state, doing, you know, really, you know, who were they working for primarily? It was for the state, not for shareholders first. State first, shareholders probably second tertiary concern because employees would come before their internet stocks, in my view, probably are being turned into um, quasi SOEs, that probably means they do start, the, the D rating we're seeing now has more to go. And you can see on the right hand charts on this page, what happened for the banks and the telecom stocks in China. These are not necessarily bad banks or bad telecom stocks, but because you're doing national service, you don't actually make much money. You're, 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 you're basically, you're, you're always cutting your mobile fees. You're working for the consumer to give ever cheaper mobile tariffs or the banks, you're giving out subsidized zones to key strategic sectors, which means you don't make much money. So that's the, the two charts at the bottom on, on page eight here. You can see there's been not much earnings growth for the last 10 years for, for telecom stocks or, or banks. And they've not collapsed. If you go into page nine, just I'll wrap up. Does it mean China's uninvestable? No, it doesn't mean China's uninvestable. Um, so we would not agree with George Soros in his view that you can't invest in Chinese stock markets. China Construction Bank, you know, big Chinese state-owned bank, one of the better banks. Once it derated down to 0.7 times price to book from three times in 2009, so a seven-year derating process, it's actually outperformed the index over the last five years, share price up a little bit, pays a five or six percent dividend yield. So what you actually need to think about in China is you need to put in a higher equity risk premium, to reflect the risks, the policy risks, the fact that these stocks are going to probably be partly investing on areas that the government says are strategically important for China and the Chinese economy, but not necessarily those areas which are best for shareholders and return on capital employed. Remember, stock, stocks reflect return on invested capital. That is what a, you know, a, a share price is. It's, you know, you've given the, the, someone money, effectively capital and how they invest that capital is what will be reflected in the share price. Um, so once the share prices reflect a lower ROIC, they become more interesting. So we're still at the beginning of this process. So that's what leaves us pretty cautious on China, why we're not saying, you know, we don't agree with BlackRock, who've obviously been very vocal that everything's fine in China, you carry on and buy. This is clearly not a, a negative for, for shareholder returns. And therefore, that should be reflected in share prices. And we don't think the share prices really yet for most companies fully reflect the, the policy reset. For the rest of Asia, there's probably not much read across at the moment, but it doesn't really affect the way we view our Australian stocks, our Taiwanese stocks, or, or our Korean stocks, or Indian stocks, for that matter. India indirectly has been the beneficiary because obviously fund managers are taking money 
out of China, reflecting obviously the cautious and the, the, the major change in the policy parameters. And India has tended to be one of those favored places to put money. Anyway, a long, a long uh, explanation, but I hope that you know gives you a, 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 cool. That's a, good. a good idea for what we're up to. I've got a long list of questions, but I'm actually going to put one on my end before we go to those. Um, obviously, education, they've said basically it shouldn't make, uh, be a profitable exercise. What about healthcare? How does that work at the moment? Yeah, so good question. So what they did for education was basically take the, the, the core business of Chinese education companies was tutoring 12 to 18 year olds for basically the Chinese equivalent of the A-levels called the Gakao. Um, that's now a non-profit. Um, that's where they made 70, 80% of their money. The other 20 or 30% where you're teaching English as a foreign language or um, prepping people up for university exams for the, for the US or the UK can still go ahead. So, uh, but effectively, you know, the bulk of their business is gone and it may be about to happen on the Macau gaming stocks as well, where they're basically looking at how they're going to regulate the gaming and non-gaming parts of, of gambling stocks in China. So, you know, it's, it's not just confined to education. For the healthcare stocks, James, you know, you have to separate it out. There's three sides to, to healthcare in China. There's providing health insurance. So what the government's now instructed is state-owned insurance companies have to give out subsidized healthcare policies uh, to try and encourage people to take out healthcare. And that's all part of that common prosperity project. If you reduce people's healthcare liabilities by giving them health insurance, obviously take some of the liability off the government. If you make it cheaper for individuals, then hopefully they'll feel they've got a little bit more money and they'll have more babies. So this is you know, part of, all part of common prosperity. Um, so that's not great for the insurers. Good for, for dual average. Um, you know, I would say if you were doing an ESG thing, what's happening in China, and that's why ESG is such a, uh, it, it's, you know, it's such a buzzword, ESG, and it, it means different things to different people. The S in what China is doing is positive because yeah. you're making people feel better. The G is obviously bad because you're, you're, to some extent, you're suffering property rights. Um, on the, going back to the, drug, the healthcare companies, for drug companies, it's negative. Um, China has what they call their common drug list or drug reimbursement list. They just cut the prices every year to try and get drug prices down. Obviously, a bit like the NHS here, you know, it's, it's they're, they're the key cost for the Chinese equivalent of the National Health Service is drugs. So they just squeeze the, the drug companies. So if you're, unless you're doing a cutting edge treatment, you're facing a lot of pricing pressure on the drug side. So it's negative for them too. The bit in China healthcare that's interesting is some of the biotech and medical outsourcing plays. So there's a big pharmaceutical industry in China where you do do a lot of drug testing formulations for international drug companies because there's a lot of pharmacists in China. It's cheaper to do it there than to do it in the, in the States or in the, in the UK or Europe. So that, that side of the business is quite interesting. So your biotech names are just obviously quite expensive. So we have had exposure there historically, but we, we took profit. So in general, it's negative for listed healthcare companies because you see whether it's insurers or drug companies because you see margin squeeze. Cool, okay, fair enough. Um, Hong Kong and China, are they much the same thing? Do you, do you actually have a sort of favored uh, market that you want to invest through? Yeah, I mean, there's obviously three different sets or four different sets of Chinese companies. So there's Hong Kong listed Chinese stocks, which is predominantly what we own, whether MSCI classify them as Hong Kong or China. It's fairly a moot point. It's what a business does that matters, not, uh, you know, not where it's listed. Um, so we don't really differentiate. Uh, we're not particularly keen on Hong Kong domestic stocks um, for all the obvious reasons that the Hong Kong economy Hong Kong used to, you've probably all seen the adverts, we just did that one, Hong Kong, Asia's world city. Hong Kong is not Asia's world city. Hong Kong is China's financial gateway on the world. Singapore is Asia's world city um, as of two years ago. Um, so that does obviously dampen the outlook for a lot of Hong Kong domestics so banks, property. So we don't have really any exposure or very little exposure to Hong Kong domestics. If, if one was thinking that it, that it's a proper Hong Kong stock, it's utility bank or property stock. Um, what we do, most of our exposure is to Hong Kong listed China stocks. And we do have two or three A shares, which are the domestically listed China stocks, either in Shenzhen or Shanghai. And then there's obviously US listed China stocks, which are all the topical ones. They're most of the internet stocks. They are now gravitating back to be relisted in Hong Kong. And you know, the one thing China and the US do agree on is they don't want Chinese stocks listed 
in the US anymore. So we think it will happen in an orderly rather than disorderly fashion. And you're gradually seeing that transition going on at the moment. We have no US listed China stocks in the fund. Okay. Um, just focus on Tencent for a minute. So what's the um, rationale for holding that one? Yeah, so obviously it's not been a good position for the fund, James. Um, so, so Tencent historically we've always felt is the best of the big Chinese internet stocks, the best in terms of, you know, it's got a complete stranglehold on the social media sites. Um, it's also got an incredibly strong gaming business, 60-70% um, market share. This is gaming as in computer gaming, not gambling. Um, whereas if you took the Alibabas, the Pindudus, the JDs, the Meichuans, they're all competing really heavily together on the e-commerce side and ByteDance and Kwai Shu, which is ByteDance's TikTok, as hopefully most of the audience know, they're also going into e-commerce as well. So e-commerce is much, much more competitive than the segments that Tencent operate in, which is basically gaming and social media. But gaming's already quite well regulated in China, even though we've had all the latest stuff on gaming for kids. It's a very small, two or 3% of revenues come from under 18s gaming because it already was severely regulated in China, even before they put in the latest regulation, which is you have to have a face ID and you can only game one hour between eight and nine, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so three hours a week, which anyone that's got teenage boys, you know, uh, it'd be great if you could restrict them to gaming Friday, Saturday, Sunday, between eight and nine, but that's the new regulation in China. But actually it doesn't have a big impact on Tencent's business. The worry on why the share price is still struggling though is on the social media side, do they have to open up the platforms? Uh, things like things like that, Does, you know, the, the, the money that, the revenue streams from selling things in the app stores, a bit like Apple's having at the moment, does that get opened up? We still think Tencent is very well entrenched, extremely well run, buys back shares, pays dividends, best corporate governance of the internet stocks in China. So we've taken the view to stick with it. It's about four, four and a half percent of the, the fund. It's the only Chinese internet stock with a small amount of netties, but outside that, it's the only Chinese internet stock we actually hold in the fund. Okay. Um, you mentioned the debt issues in China. So how, how bad do you think they are? And, and then um, what do you think Evergrande defaulting might do to the wider market? Yeah, I mean, Evergrande, and I, I write quite detailed monthly reports. I'll be doing King Free and myself. We do write a, a detailed monthly on the fund. And if, I think we wrote in 2011 about Evergrande going bust. So <laughs> 10 years ago, we predicted this. At that point, Evergrande's share price was about four or five it's listed in Hong Kong, Hong Kong dollars. It then went up to $40. So obviously we looked like absolute idiots. Uh, it's now $2 and going bust, obviously. So, you know, we were just a little bit too early, obviously, in our call. But um, the, the real story here, though, James, is this has been the most widely predicted bankruptcy probably in Asia. Uh, you know, people were, I mean, we weren't the only people talking about it going bust in 2011. Um, the liabilities in Evergrande are quite staggering, you know, three or four hundred billion US dollars. Um, sounds like something out of an Austin Powers movie, Dr. Evil. Um, so the numbers are big. Obviously, there is assets there. They've got lots and lots of properties. Um, the key here is, you know, it should go bust. Um, it deserves to go bust. It's been incredibly badly run. Um, but what we do want it to, to happen, and normally, again, the advantage of China being state controlled and the CCP being all powerful is you hope it becomes an orderly wind down because obviously this is one, one of the biggest developers in China. There's thousands and thousands of people have put deposits down on flats. You will have riots, mass protests if it's a disorderly wind down. So I, I, effect, I effectively think it will become the, the properties get taken over by state owned developers and then you see a, a, a fairly orderly liquidation of the assets so the properties do get finished rather than a disorderly one but it's it's a huge company it will take a lot of time i would be very surprised if foreign born, foreign bondholders get any money back whatsoever or equity holders um, and i would fully expect two or three other very geared property developers in china will also go bankrupt so you know, I'd be very careful of anyone owning offshore US dollar Chinese bonds. And to be fair, no one deserves to get any money back. There was a reason why these bonds were issued at 12, 13% per cent 
coupons, uh, they were incredibly risky. So foreign bond, foreign bond, bondholders knew fine well what they were buying or should have if they bothered to look in Bloomberg and put in, there's a function called FA financial analysis, the numbers were there. So no one deserves to get any money back on the bond or equity side. Fair enough. But anyway, we expect it to be orderly. So I don't think it's going to, it will have an impact. And this is, I guess, the secondary impact of the, the question on what impact does what's happening in China have on the broader region and possibly the global economy. You know, if these measures cause the Chinese economy to slow and the Chinese economy is slowing outside the export sector, there's not much momentum domestically in China, partly because we're having COVID outbreaks in China now, because the Delta variant has appeared in Nanjing and Fujian and Guangdong. Um, so with the Chinese economy slowing, if you start having this disorderly wind of three or four major property developers, that would be a, a, another big negative for the economy, which is why the government is likely to, to intervene to try and make it a, an orderly wind down rather than disorderly wind down. Okay, fair enough. Um, how do you factor in sort of geopolitical issues? There's, there's questions here about Taiwan and the South China Sea and what's going on with this new thing with Australia and nuclear submarines. So I suppose we could include North yeah. Korea. Yeah, I mean, the biggest worry we all have is, you know, the, the Taiwan situation where, you know, President Xi's always said, you know, and he's been saying this for ever since he got in power, that Taiwan is part of China and he wants it to come back. He normally says he wants it to come back peacefully, but obviously the comments have become a little bit more, you know, aggressive, if that's the right word. We still work on the basis that um, you, you're not going to see a military action in the region. Um, there's too much for both sides to lose. Um, you know, if China did try to aggressively take Taiwan, it is an island. Those of us living in the UK, no, no it's not easy to invade an island. Um, China, it, you, they, they probably have the military wherewithal and ability to take Taiwan, but Taiwan actually has quite a, it's a well-funded military with good kit. And you've got the US, obviously the UK. I think the pact that US, UK and Australia have announced is co the correct thing to do in my view. China made it inevitable by their own huge military buildup in the region. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, but it does remain a flashpoint and a worry, you know, one that we all need to be cognizant of. But you know, if China was to try and take Taiwan, realistically, what are they going to get? Um, I'm sure every single TSMC fab will be blown up, but either by the Americans or by the Taiwanese themselves. So you're not going to inherit, you know, a great semiconductor industry. Most skilled Taiwanese will no doubt get in a boat and move to the west coast of the states. Um, so you're, you're effectively going to inherit probably a fairly hollow economy uh, at quite a lot of cost, both, both in terms of people, in terms of military, and in terms of obviously dollar cost. Uh, and then you will be a pariah. China will be cut off from global capital markets. It also would be, and let's not kid, kid ourselves, it would be probably the end of Asian equities as an asset class because you know, you take away China because it would then be uninvestable. Hong Kong would be uninvestable. You take away Taiwan because it had been bombed. Uh, that's, you know, 50 percent, 60 percent of our asset class. So, you know, any Asian fund manager has to work on the basis. This won't happen. And it just rumbles on a bit like North Korea, South Korea. You know, it's rumbled on for 30 years. It was everyone used to talk as a risk when I first started in 1990. You know, will North Korea invade South Korea, you know. It's now obviously Kim Jong-un, not his father, but, you know, same, same old, same old. But uh, we just have to hope that cool heads prevail. And it's that, that you know, how I learned to love the bomb. So mutually assured self-destruction, it, it can be quite a strong deterrent for people. But, you know, it's a risk. And it, the one thing on the flip side, the other side, the, the, the commercial Cold War we see at the moment between China and the US and increasingly the, the West more broadly, we do think we'll, we'll rumble on and you do see different technology uh, blocks building. That's part of China's dual circulation policy or self-sufficiency policy we referred to earlier. Uh, and the US is obviously busy trying to beef up their own semiconductor industry, which you know, does have implications for some of our Asian shares. TSMC has to build fabs, that's where you build semiconductors. Historically, they've always been in Taiwan. Makes much more sense to have them in Taiwan because you cluster your skill sets together. But with these things being so strategic, TSMC is building a fab in China, is building one in the States, will no doubt build one in Europe and possibly Japan as well. Okay, fair enough. 
Um, we know that you can short indices and things when you want to change the asset allocation, but, but can you short individual stocks? Uh, good question, James. No, we, we never, uh, in the history of both the Open Ended and the Investment Trust, we've never shorted individual stocks. So the purpose of the hedging overlays is about risk management. So it's about trying to reduce the volatility when we see see market risks. Um, so, you know, to the, as I said, I mentioned earlier, the way we get appraised is on, on risk adjusted returns as much as how have we done versus peers and benchmark. But a question I think from somebody who's a wise career holder, do you hold uh, Korean preference shares uh, as a preference to holding ordinary shares in Korean companies? No, typically, I mean, we do in some shorter funds. Typically for us, we've always just gone for, for the equity. If you're, if you're looking at an income fund, so Shorters does obviously run quite a lot of Asian yield and income funds, they would tend to own the preference shares because you do obviously get a, 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 a income, whereas historically Korean shares uh, have not paid great dividends. But to be fair, the Korean shares, one, you know, we are seeing, you know, from a low base improvements in corporate governance in Korea, and um, we are seeing... The, the ordinary shares paying dividends. And that's, you know, quite a lot of fund managers ourselves, including quite vocal when we engage with our companies, a lot of it is about, we want to see some dividends. And so it's a learning process, but we're finally getting there. So for us uh, at this point, we'd prefer to own, uh, for, certainly for the Asian total return investment company, uh, the ordinary shares, not the preference ones. Okay. Um, and there's quite a lot of big stocks you don't own, but what's, what's your active share? Um, I'll be honest, and that's genuinely true because I, I don't look at the index. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 if you even said, what's our underweight versus China, I wouldn't know, James, because I, I, I literally don't care. It's I would think it's pretty high because China's a huge chunk of the index. And you've yeah, China's probably about 35% of the index and we're about 13% China, but so we're probably, I've got to be 80%, but I, I honestly, it's not a number I, I, I look at, James. And um, you have got some information to me now. I did some question here. Um, how do you sort of view the sort of smaller markets within Asia? Yeah, so I mean, the smaller markets, and we, we talked about, I, should not, I normally have some charts in smaller markets, but I didn't put them in the deck, so apologies for that. So the smaller markets, and most of them are quite challenged, to be frank. So Malaysia, Indonesia, politics, not great. Economic backdrop, not great. If you think about the way the world's developing, you know, if we're moving to a more digital world, a world where, you know, I, my background is actually development economics and the, the old development thesis for an emerging market was you moved to, from agriculture to putting people in factories to make t-shirts and then it was sports shoes and, and you moved up the value added manufacturing curve. That doesn't work anymore because you know, the, the factory of the future is predominantly going to be automated. The cost of automation of a factory, whether that's robots, semiconductors, vision, you don't need people so much. So it's like, I don't know if anyone's been on the BMW website, you can see their pictures of the latest BMW factories. It's a dark factory. You don't need many workers. So your whole development model for a lot of these emerging Asian countries becomes very, very challenged. They don't have good infrastructure, a lot of them, and they don't have good education systems. So you know, it's not suddenly you've got a ton of really skilled engineers. So for Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, I don't see a comparative advantage if one wanted to put it into a, a Ricardian concept and be more economics about it. So the, the emerging countries that do look a bit more potential, India, obviously better skill sets and coming from a lower base is definitely interesting. Uh, obviously, India's got a good workforce in some of those areas that are good, that, you know, software companies for digitalization. Um, and obviously, you know, India's just about building infrastructure, putting in telecoms networks and roads, you will get growth. So they're at a much earlier stage of development from Thailand, Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, the other country obviously you touched upon is Vietnam. Vietnam is the one country where actually we are seeing good investment, lots of export industry going in there. One of the reasons we've got shortages at the moment is because a lot of things, you know, chips are fabricated in Taiwan and then they're assembled in Vietnam. So Samsung assembles a lot of its TVs, smartphones in Vietnam. Uh, Hon Hai has factories in Vietnam, a lot of garments for Nike, Adidas come from Vietnam. And Vietnam's had massive COVID outbreaks. So that's why the factories aren't working properly. And that's one of the reasons we have shortages. So Vietnam, but long-term that will get sorted. Vietnam has done well 
in actually building up an export base. So, you know, the emerging countries we like in Asia from a top-down perspective, so an economic perspective, would be India and Vietnam. The problem for investing there is Indian stock market is phenomenally expensive in the main, almost bubble-like for particularly some of the domestic consumer stocks. Vietnam, it's one of those things, the stock market goes back to the chart at the very beginning. The stock market does not reflect GDP growth. It's full of cruddy state-owned banks, corrupt property developers. Um, the good stocks, which there are a smattering of good stocks, tend to be full on their foreign premiums, so you can't actually access them. So there's a real access problem for Vietnam. So the best way to for, for this audience, if you are interested in Vietnam, is to look at some of the closed end Vietnam funds, uh, would, would be my recommendation. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you generally kind of avoid state owned businesses across the whole of Asia. Is that true? Yeah, if I don't know how old the audience is, I'm, I'm in my 50s. Uh, I can remember British Leyland and Austin Allegro's and Morris Marina's. I can remember British Steel and British Coal and Arthur Scargill. Maybe it's coming from a UK perspective, but state owned capitalism or state owned enterprises uh, you know, are nearly always a disaster. It's just a misallocation of capital. Um, I don't, you know, Chinese state owned enterprises aren't as badly run as British one, one, run ones were, but you're still having capital allocated by diktat, by the state, by civil servants, rather than by the market. We can say the pros and cons from an economic development model and from the S and society and sustainability. You know, maybe if government's allocating capital, you can decarbonize quicker. And I'm, I'm, from that perspective in China, it probably is good news that you control these things and enforce decarbonization quickly rather than try and do it through market forces. But at the end of it all, I'm not here to follow Chinese state policy objectives. I'm here to try and make money for shareholders. So it's return on invested capital that matters. And SOEs tend to invest capital badly, not well. What sort of turnover have you got on the portfolio? Yeah, it's been pretty consistent, James, around about 35% per annum. So average holding periods, three years. Um, some stocks have been in the fund since time immemorial. So TSMC and Samsung would count as, count as that. Um, some stocks, you know, lower conviction positions or higher volatility, they're only there for, for six months. But typically it's around about um, 35%. Okay. Um you, you said you're investing in the funds. Do you actually hold the open end fund as well, or is it always the IT that you favour? And I've got money in, in both funds. So um, it, 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 it's, it's disclosed in the annual report what Kingfrey and I have in the, the investment trust. Uh, for historic reasons, I do have actually, just, for complete openness, a little bit more in the open ended fund, but that's because it's been going for 13, 14 years. So it was where I had my, my initial, initial stake since. We've had both vehicles. It's been more evenly split. Any any new money that I've put in the vehicles. Great. Well, I think that's us out of time, unfortunately. But there's there's loads more questions here. But um, and maybe a bit too much from China. But but um, thank you very much for all of that. That's really helpful. Um, Great. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Thank so, you. Well, um, if there's anything else that anybody wants to ask urgently, we can just always email you directly, and we'll try and do it that way. Yeah. yeah if there's any but, burning but, questions, email them across, and we'll do our best to, yeah. to answer them. But otherwise, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, very interesting. And uh, maybe we'll get you back um, in a year or so and, and see how things have changed. But um, yeah, good. OK, Great. so um, on that note, I think we'll just wind things up. I just, uh, I'll be back next week. We'll be talking to Peter Hewitt, who's the manager of BMO Managed Portfolio, which has been one of the best performing funds of funds, actually, in, in recent times. And particularly the growth fund and it's interesting structure so um, that should be good good so um have a good week everybody and i will um see you next week thanks bye, -bye.